Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Trisha O'Neill, the National Director of Chapter Development for the National Pancreas Foundation. Welcome to our 2022 virtual education webinar. The National Pancreas Foundation's mission is to provide hope for those suffering from pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer through, cutting, through funding cutting edge research and advocating for new and better therapies and providing support and education for patients, caregivers, and healthcare professionals. Some of our featured programs include the Animated patient, Pancreas Patient, the state chapters that assist with education, fundraising, and patient support groups, and our physician programs that include research grants, medical education, and our annual fellow symposium. We are always looking for volunteers to help support our mission. For more information on how to get involved, please email us at info at pancreasfoundation.org. Tonight, our presentation will cover multi multidisciplinary management of complications associated with acute pancreatitis. Please use the Q&A section of this webinar to ask your questions and they will be addressed at the end of our presentation. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Shalindra Singh. Dr. Singh is the Director of Bariatric Endoscopy, Advanced Endoscopist, and Associate Professor of Medicine at West Virginia University. Dr. Singh received special training in advanced endoscopic procedures at Allegheny Health Network. His work has resulted in numerous publications and reputed, reputed gastroenterology and bariatric journals and extensive media coverage. He is the editor and reviewer of several medical journals. He serves on national committees, including the American Society for Gastroenterological Endoscopy, Digestive Disease Week Clinical Symposia Committee, and the American College of Gastroenterology International Committee. Thank you, Dr. Singh, and to all of our panelists tonight for supporting the National Pancreas Foundation. Thanks, Trish. On behalf of West Virginia University and National Pancreas Foundation Center of Excellence, I would like to welcome you all to the first patient education webinar of the year. We would like to thank National Pancreas Foundation for providing us with this opportunity. We will be presenting this webinar on multidisciplinary management of complications associated with acute pancreatitis. I am Dr. Shalendra Singh. I will be moderating today's session and also provide a basic background on acute pancreatitis and related complications. Our first speaker will be Dr. Matthew Kraft, Dr. Kraft is an assistant professor, advanced endoscopist at West Virginia University. Dr. Kraft will be talking about medical management of acute pancreatitis. Dr. Tucker is a professor and director of advanced endoscopy at West Virginia University. Dr. Tucker will be discussing about endoscopic management of acute pancreatitis complications. Our next speaker will be Dr. Grammer. Dr. Grammer is an assistant professor and interventional radiologist at West Virginia University. Dr. Grammer will talk about the role of interventional radiology for management of acute pancreatitis complications. Our final speaker will be Dr. Brian Boone. Dr. Boone is an assistant professor, surgical oncologist at West Virginia University. Dr. Boone's topic for today's seminar will be surgical management of acute pancreatitis complications. At the end of the panel presentations, there will be Q&A session. Please type your questions in the chat box anytime during the presentation. We'll try to answer all questions during the Q&A session at the end of all presentations. Acute pancreatitis refers to inflammation of the pancreas that can cause sudden severe abdominal pain and elevated levels of pancreatic enzymes in the blood. Pancreas is an important organ that lies in the back of the mid-abdomen behind the stomach. It produces digestive juices and certain hormones, including insulin. There are multiple causes of acute pancreatitis. Gallstones are the most common cause of acute pancreatitis, counting for about 40 to 70 percent of cases. However, not all patients with gallstones develop pancreatitis. Only 3 to 7% of patients with gallstones develop pancreatitis. Small stones are more likely than the larger stones to pass through the gallbladder into the cystic duct, further into the bile duct and obstruct the ampulla. The bile duct and the pancreas duct 
combine at the ampulla to drain into the small intestine. Two factors has been suggested at possible initiating event in gallstone pancreatitis. Reflux of bile into the pancreatic duct due to transient obstruction at the ampulla during the passage of gallstone or obstruction at the ampulla second to stone or inflammation resulting from the passage of a stone. Alcohol is responsible for approximately 25 to 35% of cases of acute pancreatitis in the United States. Multiple mechanisms by which alcohol can cause injury to the pancreas and result in pancreatitis have been suggested. If we look at the cause of acute pancreatitis, majority of these cases are caused by either gallstones or alcohol. Other less common causes of pancreatitis include hypertriglyceridemia. Serum triglyceride concentrations about 1000 can precipitate attacks of acute pancreatitis, although lower levels may also contribute to severity. Pancreatitis can also result as a complication after ERCP. Important risk factors include low volume ERCP experience of endoscopist, sphincter of OD dysfunction, difficult cannulation, and performance of a therapeutic rather than a diagnostic ERCP. Autoimmune pancreatitis is an inflammation caused by body's immune system attacking the pancreas, and this usually responds to steroid therapy. Genetic risk. Patients with genetic risk for pancreatitis may present as recurrent acute pancreatitis or childhood pancreatitis without a known cause and eventually progress to chronic pancreatitis. Genetic pancreatitis is generally related to a gain of function mutation in the PRSS1 gene. Mutations in the SPINK1 or CFTR gene can also result in genetic pancreatitis. Majority of idiopathic cases appear to have a genetic risk, especially younger patients less than 35 years of age. More rare causes of pancreatitis also includes medication. Prognosis of pancreatitis related to medication is generally good. Anatomic or physio physiologic pancreatic abnormalities. Pancreatic divism as a cause of pancreatitis remains controversial. Pancreatic duct injury related to blunt or penetrating trauma can damage the pancreas. Hypercalcemia high is high levels of calcium in the blood. Infections and toxins has also been implicated in acute pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is termed idiopathic if no obvious etiology is identifiable by history, laboratory test, and gallbladder ultrasound, and this can happen in up to 25 to 30% of patients with acute pancreatitis. Two of the following are required to make a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. Abdominal pain, which is usually sudden, severe, constant pain in the upper part of the abdomen that can radiate to the back. Threefold or more elevation in pancreatic enzymes. Inflammation of pancreas on CT scan or MRI. It is important to recognize the severity of pancreatitis because the prognosis depends on the severity. There is no organ damage and local or systemic complications in mild pancreatitis and prognosis is generally good. Moderately severe acute pancreatitis is characterized by a transient organ failure. That is the organ failure resolves within 48 hours or there are local or systemic complications. Severe pancreatitis is characterized by persistent organ failure that may involve one or multiple organs. Approximately 50 to 25% of all patients can develop moderately severe or severe pancreatitis, which increases the risk of complications and death. Acute pancreatitis can cause multiple complications. These complications will be discussed in detail by our speakers. Local complications include acute fluid collection around the pancreas from leakage of pancreatic juices. After four weeks, these fluid collection can form a mature wall and then they are called pancreatic pseudocyst. Similarly, acute necrotic collections can result in early period after pancreatitis, which can mature into wall of necrosis.
Other complications include ascites, pleural effusions, peritonitis. Acute pancreatitis can also lead to biliary obstruction and stricture formation in the bile duct and pancreatic duct. Other complications include systemic inflammatory response syndrome, sepsis, multi-organ failure, bleeding, thrombosis of the centric blood vessels, and acute recurrent pancreatitis that can eventually result in development of chronic pancreatitis. Thank you. Now we will move to our first speaker. Hi, this is Matthew Kraft. I'm an assistant professor at West Virginia University. I'm here to talk to you about acute pancreatitis and the medical and nutritional management of this disease. The initial management of acute pancreatitis is supportive care. This consists of fluid resuscitation, pain control, and nutritional support. The American Gastroenterological Association suggests using goal-directed intravenous fluid therapy for management of acute pancreatitis. What we do is we adjust intravenous fluid rates to achieve certain clinical and laboratory parameters. Specifically, our goals with fluid therapy are to achieve normal heart rate, normal blood pressure, adequate urine output, and things we want to avoid are giving so much fluid that we dilute the blood counts of the patient, or that we cause excessive fluid accumulation in the lungs. So bottom line is intravenous fluids are the cornerstone of the initial management of acute pancreatitis. A little bit more about why intravenous fluids are so important in the initial management of a patient with acute pancreatitis. It's been shown that early fluid resuscitation, meaning within the first 12 to 24 hours after onset of pancreatitis, is associated with reduced morbidity and mortality. Fluid resuscitation helps prevent a certain aspect of shock, specifically the hypovolemic component, which means you don't have enough volume in your blood vessels. Uh, hypovolemic shock is a problem because that lack of blood flow can result in poor perfusion of the pancreas tissue. And this can lead to pancreas necrosis, which means death of the pancreas tissue. And this would generally constitute a case of severe pancreatitis. We have two main options in terms of fluid treatments. One is lactated ringers. The other is normal saline. Currently, lactated ringers is favored as there is some evidence suggesting that may decrease the inflammatory milieu associated with acute pancreatitis. Also, um, excessive administration of normal saline can sometimes result in acid-based disturbances in the patient. A word about antibiotics in the setting of acute pancreatitis. Unfortunately, some patients who present with acute pancreatitis are given prophylactic antibiotics. And this is because the clinical picture can be confusing to the provider because acute pancreatitis can result in a state of shock, which can mimic shock due to sepsis or bacterial infection. But for clear-cut acute pancreatitis, antibiotics have no role and that includes patients with mild, moderate, and severe pancreatitis. Another question that commonly comes up in the management of patients with acute pancreatitis is feeding. Bowel rest was the traditional dogma, meaning that it was once thought that by not eating, you would rest the pancreas and you wouldn't aggravate it by causing it to create those digestive juices to break down your food. But it's now been shown by evidence-based guidelines that early oral nutrition hastens recovery and decreases hospitalization length. And one of the mechanisms by which it may do this is by protecting the gut mucosal barrier. There's an image on the right that illustrates this concept, which is that oral ingestion of food helps maintain a healthy gut barrier and 
when you go prolonged periods of time with fasting, you can have breakdown of this barrier, which can lead to translocation of bacteria into the bloodstream, thereby increasing your risk of infection. Given the health benefits of early feeding in acute pancreatitis, the AGA recommends that early oral feeding be initiated as tolerated, and that this is superior to uh, a nothing by mouth approach, which again is that old, that old dogma of bowel rest. However, early feeding is not always possible due to symptoms of acute pancreatitis, such as pain, vomiting, or a slow intestine. So in some cases where patients are particularly symptomatic, oral feeding can be delayed up to three days, or a nasoenteric feeding tube can be placed to facilitate feeding if the patient's intolerant of oral feeding. If the patient is unable to commence oral feeding within three days, it's generally recommended to insert a nasoenteric feeding tube. So this means a tube that is passed through the nose, down the throat, down the esophagus, and either terminates in the stomach, the duodenum, or the jejunum. The duodenum and jejunum are segments of the small intestine. Through this nasoenteric feeding tube, we can give either semi-elemental formulas or elemental formulas. And the difference in these are the level of pre-digestion of the formula feeds. What is not recommended is to begin total parenteral nutrition or TPN. TPN is much more expensive than enteral feeding and carries significant risk of complications such as bloodstream infection, and blood clot. Uh, also, by not feeding the gut, you are increasing the risk of bacterial translocation, which increases your risk of infection. So this is a hard no that we do not give TPN for nutritional management in the setting of acute pancreatitis. Now a word about splanchnic vein thrombosis in the setting of acute pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis can cause blood clots or thrombosis in the surrounding venous system, including the splenic vein, superior mesenteric vein, and portal vein. These are the veins that drain the spleen, intestines, and colon. Isolated blood clot in the splenic vein is the most common type of blood clot that occurs in acute pancreatitis, and anticoagulation is typically not recommended for this type of blood clot as splenic vein thrombosis typically improves with resolution of acute pancreatitis. Now, a blood clot in the portal vein or superior mesenteric vein is less common, but carries more morbidity. So anticoagulation is recommended for symptomatic complete occlusion of the portal vein and superior mesenteric vein. And what do I mean by symptoms? I mean consequences such as ascites from the portal vein being occluded or bowel ischemia from the superior mesenteric vein being occluded. Of course, anticoagulation is contraindicated in these settings for reasons such as active GI bleeding or large gastric varices with imminent rupture. Excessive alcohol consumption is the number two cause of acute pancreatitis in the United States. Among patients with alcohol use disorder, approximately 10% will experience acute pancreatitis in their lifetime. For this reason, it is recommended that alcohol intervention be performed during the index admission for alcohol-related acute pancreatitis. And the purpose of this is to educate and inform the patient of the etiology of their acute pancreatitis and hopefully prevent repeated episodes of acute pancreatitis in the future. Paracelsus once said, all things are poison and nothing is without poison. The dosage alone makes it so a thing is not a poison. So keeping this phrase in mind, I wanted to briefly define what's considered safe drinking, heavy, and binge drinking. 
safe amounts of alcohol are generally considered less than one drink a day for women, less than two drinks a day for men. When you start getting into the heavy drinking category, that refers to at least three drinks a day or seven drinks a week for women, four drinks a day or 14 drinks a week for men. And this is the category where you're at high risk of alcohol-related complications, such as acute pancreatitis. Of course, binge drinking puts you even in an even higher risk category, and this refers to more than four drinks in an occasion for women and more than five drinks in an occasion for men. Good evening. It is my pleasure to speak to you today about endoscopic management of complications from acute pancreatitis. Now, as some of you know, pancreatitis is the number one cause of hospital admissions in the United States from a GI standpoint. There are approximately a quarter of a million hospital admissions annually in the United States from pancreatitis, and inpatient costs exceed 2.5 billion US dollars. When evaluating pancreatitis, we generally grade it in terms of severity, mild, moderate, and severe. Mild pancreatitis has minimal organ injury and resolves uneventfully. Moderate and severe pancreatitis are associated with organ failure. And when severe pancreatitis occurs, this can either be an interstitial edematous type, which is the most common, or a necrotizing type, where actually part of the gland dies. Here you can see several CAT scan images that depict the findings. When interstitial pancreatitis happens, you get this well-enhanced pancreas, as you can see by the red arrows, with fluid around the pancreas in the white arrows in the upper left-hand image. Over time, this fluid can organize into what we call pseudocysts, which you see in the lower left-hand image. In the upper right-hand image, you see a very different finding of the pancreas where there is tissue and solid material that's not bright, not enhancing from the contrast administration in the CAT scan. This is consistent with necrotizing pancreatitis. This means that the tissue is no longer viable. And this area can actually organize over time from the infl inflammatory reactions into an area of what we call walled off necrosis in the bottom right hand image. Now these collections uh, in the bottom images can get infected, can obstruct the stomach, can cause symptoms. And by causing symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, or obstructions of the bile duct that lead to jaundice or gastric outlet obstructions, they can also cause pain and they can also get infected. These are indications for us to intervene and drain these collections. We have several different methods of trying to drain these collections, and they include endoscopically guided transmural drainage or percutaneous drainage by placing a catheter in through the skin, or again, endoscopically guided transpapillary drainage or surgery. Now, when we talk about endoscopically guided transmural drainage, here you can see an image of a depiction of a scope and these arrows indicate our ability to see the pancreas through the stomach wall using what we call endoscopic ultrasound. This essentially has an ultrasound transducer at the tip of the scope that allows us to visualize the pancreas. In this example, you'll see one of these collections that we encounter. Uh, this is consistent with a pseudocyst after an about of interstitial pancreatitis. Under endoscopic ultrasound guidance, we can actually access this cavity using a needle and then place a wire through the needle into the cavity. You can see the nice round circles that were made. We can then dilate, open a tract that allows us to place stents from that cavity into the stomach and allows that pseudocyst to be drained internally. This is known as a cyst gastrostomy procedure and works very well for patients who have 
fluid collections that result from interstitial pancreatitis without any necrotizing debris or solid material within the cavity. And there you see the final image of the stents under fluoroscopic examination under x-ray essentially. Now, what about for patients who develop these walled off necrotic collections? Well, these are a bit more difficult to manage. However, uh, we can do successfully using endoscopic guidance. We can actually use a very well-designed lumen opposing metal stent that we can actually under EUS guidance, gain access into the cavity and deploy a flange within the cavity and then deploy another flange within the stomach. We can then stretch this open and actually access the cavity and clear out some of that necrotic debris or dead pancreas that had developed because some of that area can oftentimes get infected when this happens. And by clearing it, we, we essentially stop that infection from threatening the patient's life. Here's an example of what we're talking about. So under EUS guidance, we access that walled off necrosis cavity, deploy that part of the stent, and then under endoscopic guidance, deploy the other aspect of the stent. We then stretch open the waist of the stent and simply then introduce our scope through that stent into the cavity. Here you can see the necrotic debris that has occurred from that walled off necrosis from that episode of severe necrotizing pancreatitis. We can clear this necrotic debris using different types of snares, grasping devices, or nets. And once cleared out, this cavity then, then collapsed spontaneously and we can remove these stents within four to five weeks. And these patients do uh, very well. When we look at the EUS guided transmural drainage versus a surgical approach that had traditionally been done over many years, um, what we found is, is that the EUS guided approach uh, has significantly significant advantages in terms of procedural duration, disease-related adverse events, um, outcomes, length of ICU stay, and mean total costs. And you know, for this reason, EUS has really emerged as a standard of care to drain these collections when they're in good opposition to the stomach, when they're close to the small intestines, where we can easily access them. And part of how we do this at West Virginia University of Medicine is, is we have a multidisciplinary team where we get together and review every case of complicated pancreatic disease that comes in through the door. And together we determine what the best approach for the patient is. And if we believe it is an endoscopic approach that would be consistent with an EUS transmural drainage, then that's the way we proceed. But in general, we look for these features that, that will predict good success in terms of that form of drainage when we consider endoscopic management. Another way in which we can perform endoscopic management is through ERCP. ERCP is essentially a radiologic procedure that's performed via an endoscope to diagnose and treat conditions of the bile duct and pancreas duct. We can perform procedures to, to drain the bile duct when it's been obstructed and the patients develop jaundice or pain. Here's just an example of how we do that. Uh, we essentially uh, access the pancreas duct using a wire if we need to drain the pancreas duct, or we can access the bile duct simply by uh, placing a wire in through the duct by accessing it through the major papilla in the small intestines. Here's just an example of a patient who presented with acute recurrent pancreatitis. They actually had this disconnected pancreas duct and developed pancreatitis and the duct had developed such an injury that there was a fluid collection uh, that was communicating with the duct and then the upstream duct, as you can see here in the next image. As we continue to inject, that collection was also associated with a stricture and it led to a significantly uh, dilated upstream pancreas duct. Well, by placing a stent through all this, we were able to decompress that duct, treat the stricture, treat the fluid collection, and ultimately resolve this patient's symptoms 
the patient did very well with just that simple pancreatic duct stenting. Another way we use ERCP is for the bile duct stenting to relieve obstructions related to acute inflammation that are causing jaundice or pain or potentially infection in the bile duct. Uh, here you can see an example of how we place these stents across an area of obstruction. And once the stent is deployed, uh, you can see that there's good drainage that will occur from the bile duct. And this can relieve symptoms of jaundice or itching. It can relieve uh, areas of infection if that bile duct has developed an infection from the obstruction. And there you can see the yellow bile now that's coming out of the stent uh, pretty nicely. One final way in which endoscopy is able to help manage complications of pancreatitis is when patients develop obstructions of the GI lumen from pancreatitis and can't tolerate food by mouth. In these situations, we can place what's known as nasal jejunal feeding tubes or feeding tubes into the GI tract. And essentially what we do is uh, leave a wire beyond that area of obstruction. As you saw, there was a narrowed area in the small intestines. Once we place that wire, we can then advance a catheter that will allow for feeding uh, that goes over the wire and all the way down into the small intestines. In this manner, we can provide enteral nutrition safely and effectively to the patient that can also optimize the outcomes that are related to the pancreatitis. And the data that we've seen to date, we've seen very good outcomes when patients are fed enterally um, and provide a proper nutrition during the course of severe pancreatitis. To summarize, endoscopic therapies continue to revolutionize the management of pancreatic complications. Nutrition, pain, obstruction, and infection can all be treated through endoscopic modalities. A multidisciplinary team review of these complications is key to determining if and when endoscopic interventions should be employed. Thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. I'm Bob Bramer. I'm the Chief of Interventional Radiology at West Virginia University. And today I'm going to talk about what IRA can do to assist in the management of acute pancreatitis. Before we start, I need to answer this question What is interventional radiology? IR is especially the performance minimally invasive procedures using various imaging modalities like X-ray, CT, or ultrasound to guide the operation. Uh, and here at WVU, we're fortunate enough to have a room like this one that has each of these within the same room uh, with the X-ray machine to the C-arm here, the CT machine back here. You can see part of the ultrasound kind of tucked back here in the corner. Um, and here in the center of the procedure table. And most interventional radiology procedures happen in rooms at least that look similar to this one, but may not have all the same capabilities. Um, and often our procedures are performed through the smallest of incisions and typically use moderate for twilight sedation. So now that we know what interventional radiology is, how can we help? First, we need to identify the most common reasons that pancreatitis would lead you to visit us in interventional radiology. Uh, the two most common being fluid collections and the bleeding complications. So as we move forward, I'll try to answer the most common questions about what we can do, how we do it, and what happens after. The first complication I'm going to talk about is the peripancreatic fluid collection. And as you've heard, there are multiple types of fluid collections, each with its own name. But it's important to keep in mind that just because the fluid is there does not mean it needs to be drained. Here at WVU, we work as a team to discuss each of these cases and decide if a collection needs to be drained. And if so, what is the best way to clear it up? Whether it be from the surgical route, or from GI, or from interventional radiology, or sometimes they require a combined approach. On the IR side, we do what is called an image-guided percutaneous drainage catheter placement, which is really just to say that we use image guidance to place a catheter through the skin into the collection that we want to drain. So now say our team has decided that a collection needs to be drained and that IR is the best approach. Now what? How do we do it? We start with the CT that we work on the collection, and here we can see the CT scan showing this large fluid collection here in the, in the middle of the abdomen where the pancreas used to live. And just for reference, here we have the kidneys and the liver here. This is the front of the body, back of the body, and the right and left sides. And during the procedure, we first place the CT grid lines here to help find a safe starting point to get into the fluid. And once we find our safe starting point, we guide this needle in through the skin into the collection using the CT scanner to guide us. Once the needle is in the right place, we then feed a wire into that fluid collection and then exchange the needle out for the drainage catheter. 
And here you can see the drain entering the collection through the skin. Important things that we all consider before placing a drain. First, the fluid collection needs to be big enough for the drain. And second, in a safe place where we can get to it through the skin. We also make sure we talk with the GI and surgery teams to see if there's an alternative way to drain the collection because no one wants the drain weighing them down. In general, the collection can be accessed from the GI endoscopy route. That is the best, but sometimes the percutaneous drain is absolutely necessary. And here's an example of a typical drainage catheter. This is the inside into the fluid collection. This is the outside. They come in different sizes, ranging from about four French to 20 French. That's about two millimeters, which is the size of about a cell phone cable charger, to seven millimeters, which is about the size of a typical drinking straw. The bigger the catheter, the more it can drain, but also the bigger the hole it can create, which can lead to wound healing trouble once the drain comes out. Which is another reason why it is like to avoid this kind of drainage procedure unless absolutely necessary. The outside is then connected to a collection bag with a three-way valve in between. This three-way valve can then be used to help flush the catheter. It's important to monitor the drainage, flush the catheter, and keep your follow up appointments so that we know when we can take these drains out, which is then typically the next question. How long do I have to keep this drain in place? The short answer is typically as long as it's needed. And during this time, the tube can be changed or replaced as needed. We often start with the smallest tube, but if that doesn't work, we can exchange it for a bigger one. Once the tube is in place, these changes are simple procedures, also done under x-ray guidance. And then what if the biggest tube we have doesn't work? We can also place additional drains or our surgery colleagues can clean out the fluid collection. And I believe Dr. Boone will be talking about that more later. So the next thing we're talking about are the bleeding complications. The pancreas is surrounded by multiple large blood vessels, in particular the splenic artery here that runs behind the pancreas. These arteries can get weakened and injured and possibly rupture, which then leads to just bleeding into the abdomen. Or they try to heal themselves, which doesn't always work and can turn into a pseudoaneurysm or also a fake aneurysm because there isn't any normal artery wall holding them back. These can also rupture and are really just bleeding events in the making. So that again is a place where IR can help. We can perform the procedure called an angiogram and embolization. Angiograms are x-ray pictures of your blood vessels using contrast and embolization here refers to the way we repair the injury or bleeding. We typically gain access to the blood vessels through your femoral artery over your hip or your radial artery in your wrist. And then we navigate through these blood vessels to the site of the injury around the pancreas using x-rays in a series of smaller and smaller tubes or catheters. And this is our typical setup. We use this outer catheter or sheath to get into the arteries here and here, and then guide slightly smaller catheter through the sheath to get near the site of injury, which is this catheter here, and then through that, an even smaller catheter to navigate to the actual site of injury. Once we get there, we use a variety of techniques to repair the injury. Typically, it's one of these three techniques here, and these top two are using coils, which are tiny metal wires that take on a helical or a coil shape when we push them out of the microcatheter, which you can see here. And in this case, we, here we use coils to plug the hole in the artery itself. In this case, we use the coils to stop blood flow through the injured segment by putting coils on the far side and the near side of the injury, and oftentimes fill this gap in between. And in this case, here we're using a covered stent to act as a patch to cover the site of injury. And all these devices are implanted and typically there to stay, and rarely, if ever, do they actually cause much issue, and you don't really know they're there. So this puts it all together. Here you see the sheath in either artery here for access, and then the sheath catheters and wires are navigated to the site of injury here in the splenic artery. And you can see here the big pseudoaneurysm. You can remember that the pancreas lives right here in front of that splenic artery. And in this case, they used a covered stent to patch the hole. And this is a real case example. This here is an angiogram. You can see contrast being injected through this catheter here into the splenic artery, which goes here. And again, this is the spleen there. And just again, the pancreas lives right here in front. Here you can see this big outpouching here is that pseudoaneurysm in the splenic artery. And in this case, we're able to repair the injury with a covered stent. You can see stretching here, with a wire across the injury site. And you can see when we inject contrast, that, that area where the pseudoaneurysm was no longer fills and that area has been repaired. And finally, another similar case here, 
There's another large pseudoaneurysm here in the far part of the splenic artery, which is in this case ruptured. As you can see, the contrast spilling out this way. And in this case, the piston wasn't going to work because of how twisted the artery was on its way out to there. So in this case, we placed coils across the injured artery and stopped the bleeding. As you can see, the coils here and no more feeling of that large pseudoaneurysm and no more bleeding. So what happens next? If the procedure worked and stopped the bleeding, uh, the typical recovery includes a hospital stay and monitoring for any kind of repeat bleeding. Um, if the bleeding doesn't stop with the embolization, then surgery is most likely the next step. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and open for any questions. Good evening. My name is Brian Boone. I'm a surgical oncologist and pancreatic surgeon at West Virginia University. Thank you for attending the seminar tonight and for the NPF for the opportunity to uh, speak with you. I'll be talking about the surgical management of complications from acute pancreatitis. And most often patients with pancreatic cancer don't need surgery in the acute setting. Uh, however, there are some select indications that we'll talk about where this, where this will play a role. And I've broken these down into drainage procedures where we internally or externally drain collections around the pancreas. Um, I'll talk about a, briefly about a, a rare complication called abdominal compartment syndrome and the management of this. And then we'll talk about strictures or narrowing of different um, organs related to pancreatitis. And this tends to happen more in the late stages of the disease and after chronic inflammation, but it can happen from a single episode of acute pancreatitis. And so we'll talk about strictures in the bile duct duodenum and pancreas and how we use surgery to bypass these areas of narrowing. And then finally, we'll end with a brief uh, bit about minimally invasive approaches, which have really revolutionized our uh, surgical technique and approaches to these uh, problems. So we're going to start with a surgical cyst gastrostomy. And much like Dr. Tucker discussed the endoscopic management of peripancreatic fluid collections, this is essentially a similar surgical approach in which we are able to drain a collection around the pancreas internally into the stomach. And so we use this in the setting of acute pancreatitis where uh, the pancreas necroses or dies. And over time, the body is able to wall that off into a single collection that is full of necrotic debris. And these can often become infected, and then uh, we term this infected necrosis, and it, it ends up often requiring drainage. Uh, and we prefer to drain this into the stomach to allow the pancreatic contents to drain into the GI tract uh, rather than externally when possible. And so we'll talk about cyst gastrostomy as a method for that. There's another population um, who also benefits from a cyst gastrostomy, and these are patients who develop a pseudocyst of the pancreas. And I liken a pseudocyst of the pancreas to a blister. This is essentially occurs from damage due to acute pancreatitis. And although most of these get better on their own, they can become large enough that they push on organs around them and cause symptoms. And when they don't go away on their own and they cause symptoms, then that warrants drainage, either with endoscopic approaches as has already been discussed or with the surgical approach that I'll show you next. So with the surgical cyst gastrostomy, we take advantage of the fact that the pancreas sits right behind the stomach. And basically we open the stomach on the, the top surface and then through the back of the stomach, we're able to open the back wall and enter the pancreatic fluid collection. And here you see that from a side view. Uh, showing how we're able to drain the collection through the stomach. And this allows us to drain the fluid as well as reach instruments into the collection itself and pull out some of that thicker necrotic debris. And then eventually, we, once it's cleaned out, we're able to close the top part of the stomach here, and that leaves the back part open to drain into the stomach itself. And so this is a, a very effective method for draining these collections. It's more invasive than Dr. Tucker's endoscopic approach, but it, it can lead to adequate drainage. And so there are certain circumstances where we favor this um, over the endoscopic drainage. For most patients, we prefer here at WVU an endoscopic approach. Uh, however, for patients who also need their gallbladder out, it is reasonable to try to do both of these procedures at the same operation and then spare them the need for two separate procedures and the need for anesthesia. And so we sometimes will do a surgical cyst gastrostomy when we need to take out a gallbladder. The other circumstances in patients who have 
really extensive necrotic collections with a lot of thick debris. Because we're able to reach, um, you know, working instruments into the stomach and collection, we're able to clean these out really well. And our advanced endoscopists do a, a great job of doing it endoscopically, but for some collections, um, we, we prefer a surgical approach to really get those extensive areas cleaned out. Another method that we use to debris the pancreas or drain collections is, is retroperitoneally. And essentially this means from the side or the flank um, in order to get to the collection. And we typically utilize what's known as a step up approach, which was um, described in a, a Dutch clinical trial that, that showed the efficacy of this technique. And essentially what we do is start with the least invasive, which is a, a drain placement into a collection with a radiologist and then monitor for improvement. And if there is no improvement, then we step up to a second drain. And if that also does not lead to adequate drainage and relief of symptoms, then we step up to surgical debridement. And once we get to surgical debridement, there are several different approaches. Some of them use the historic open, um, make an incision over the drain and get down to the collection and, and pull it out with instruments. But there are also a variety of minimally evasive techniques described where we use the drain as a guide uh, to drain these collections. And this, as I'll show you in the next picture, is really ideal for collections that are located near the side of the abdomen and they're not centrally located near the stomach. And so they're not amenable to endoscopic or surgical cystostomies. And we really need to debris them from the lateral uh, part of the abdomen or the side. And this picture demonstrates what I mean. Um, here you see a collection in brown that is near the stomach, but also extends all the way out laterally, um, all the way up to the abdominal wall and the abdominal musculature. And so we work with our interventional radiology colleagues to place a drain into this collection. And then if there's no improvement over time, we can place a second drain and use both of those drains as guides to get from the outside into the collection. And you can either do this through an incision um, and sticking instruments into the collection to debride it, or you can lose, use laparoscopic ports and instruments and do a completely minimally invasive approach to go in and debride uh, this area from, from the outside. And typically we'll use large drains uh, to drain the pancreas after we finish the procedure and debride as much as possible. I want to briefly discuss a rare complication called abdominal, abdominal compartment syndrome. And this occurs when pressure builds up in the abdomen from a variety of sources that, that can complicate acute pancreatitis. Oftentimes patients need a large amount of fluids or they have a bleeding complication that adds intra-abdominal volume, uh, which can increase the pressure. And then commonly patients who have pancreatitis because of that inflammation, their bowel does not squeeze and empty the way it should. And so they get what's called an ileus where the bowel gets very distended and full and that also leads to increased pressure. And the abdominal pressure that increases then results in several problems for the patient. Um, the abdomen pressure pushing up into the chest makes it difficult to breathe. And most of these patients are on a ventilator and it can even make the ventilator difficult to uh, provide adequate oxygen and ventilation because of that pressure. It also pushes on the vena cava, which brings blood back to the heart. And so the blood pressure is typically low because the blood is not returning to the heart adequately. It also decreases the amount of blood flow to the kidney, which results in kidney problems. And then in the late stages, it can actually reduce the blood flow to the intestines, which can cause the intestine to die. And so these patients are really uh, critically ill. And there are some temporizing measures we can use, such as paralyzing the patient and letting their abdominal muscles relax so that the, the abdomen can expand. Or sometimes if there's a large amount of fluid in the abdomen, we're able to drain it. But these are really just temporizing things for most patients. And when this occurs, we really rely on a laparotomy, which is an incision all through the upper abdomen, all the way to the lower abdomen, right down the middle, that allows the abdomen to then open and relieve that pressure. And when abdominal compartment syndrome is the diagnosis, this results in really immediate improvement in the patient's physiologic status, their vital signs, um, but they remain critically ill. And when we looked at our series of patients who had to undergo this procedure, only about half of them survived. So developing this complication is associated with a, a pretty poor prognosis.
I want to move on now to what's called strictures, which essentially is narrowing of, of a structure due to the inflammation associated with pancreatitis. And the first one we're going to talk about is a bile duct or biliary stricture. Because the bile duct here in green runs right through the head of the pancreas, sometimes that inflammation from a single episode of acute pancreatitis can cause a narrowing of the pancreatic duct. And this is more common in the setting of repeated inflammation and chronic pancreatitis, but it can happen after a single episode. And when this happens, bile has trouble draining out of the liver and through this narrowing. And so patients can become uh, very ill and jaundiced. And um, with the endoscope, our, our GI colleagues are typically able to get a stent across these strictures. Um, however, in the long term, um, those stents have to continuously be replaced. And so we will oftentimes consider surgical drainage, which essentially provides a new connection with the bile duct to a new piece of bowel and allows us to bypass that narrowly. And we use what's called a Ruin Y uh, reconstruction, which is because of these two limbs of the bowel here that form what almost looks like a Y. And that just allows bile to flow um, past the stomach and the first part of the intestine um, and join up later downstream to aid in, in digestion. Another stricture that can occur is, is in the duodenum. The duodenum is the first part of the intestine after the stomach and the pancreas sits right here in the middle of it. And so what can happen from that inflammation is the duodenum will scar down and then food has trouble passing out of the stomach across that narrowing and patients have trouble eating and they have trouble with nausea and vomiting. And so when this occurs, we can actually form a bypass where we bring a piece of intestine from downstream and hook it up to the stomach in a different location. And that allows food to pass straight down and around this, this narrowing. Finally, I wanna talk about pancreatic strictures. So pancreatitis can also lead to strictures in the pancreatic duct itself. And so what you see is a narrowing uh, here in the mid part of the pancreas from damage related to pancreatitis. And that leads to distension or dilation of the pancreas duct downstream where this fluid is unable to drain out. And so there are several drainage procedures that can be performed, but the one I'm gonna to highlight today is called a lateral pancreatic OJ genostomy or PUSTO procedure. And essentially what we do in this procedure is open up the pancreas to get access to that duct and, and open the duct up completely. And then we take a piece of intestine up and sew it to that pancreatic duct. And this allows the pancreas to drain around the stricture into this new piece of intestine. And that um, really can help patients in terms of avoiding recurrent pancreatitis and also improving symptoms of abdominal pain and nausea, uh, especially with eating. So I wanted to just briefly mention uh, minimally invasive surgery and these approaches in the management of these complications. Uh, more and more often at academic centers around the country, we are utilizing either laparoscopic or robotic instruments to accomplish the same surgeries internally. But this is in contrast to uh, an open incision that you see here on the left, where we have to make a, a large incision up and down in the middle of the abdomen versus a minimally invasive surgery with several small incisions where we can put working ports into the abdomen and accomplish the same thing. And this has the potential to improve patient's recovery and result in less pain and shorter length of stay. Um, and it, as I said, has really changed uh, many, many places around the country. We changed our approach to uh, complications from pancreatitis and how we perform these surgeries. So I thank the NPF for the opportunity to present. I'll be happy to answer your questions at the end of the session. Or um, if you'd like to shoot me an email, if you think of something down the road, I'd be happy to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Now um, we'll be open to uh, some questions. So the first question is to Dr. Tucker. Um, a patient has 27 episodes of acute pancreatitis um, and the third um, severe third spacing of fluid shift with pleural effusion, poor urine output, decreased O2 sets, uh, respiratory uh, failures. Um, so how will you describe um, this, this this episode of pancreatitis and is it and uh, this episode was considered idiopathic. So, Doctor uh, Tucker, can you talk about the severity um, and how will you grade this uh, episode of acute pancreatitis and also a little bit about idiopathic pancreatitis? Yeah, thank you, uh, Doctor Singh. Uh, 
can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So, you know, this is a, a tough case of acute recurrent pancreatitis uh, that's idiopathic in nature. And as you described, when we say idiopathic, it essentially means that there hasn't been a clear cut cause that we've found or known to be the cause of this patient's acute recurrent pancreatitis. You know, what's being described here is essentially some decreased urine output. So that becomes concerning for some underlying kidney failure that's occurred with these episodes. Uh, there's also uh, some, what also is being described is decreased oxygen saturations and two respiratory arrests, uh, which is obviously consistent with uh, uh, lung failure. So, or respiratory failure, I should say. So in that situation, I would consider this a moderate or severe type pancre uh, pancreatitis episodes uh, that have occurred. Now, the uh, other episodes that have occurred may have resolved uneventfully, and those episodes have may have been mild or uh, episodes of acute pancreatitis. And the important thing to note here is, is we grade the episode of pancreatitis in terms of severity, but not the uh, overall patient's condition. We would grade the patient's condition as an acute pancreatitis or a chronic pancreatitis. And chronic pancreatitis can be severe, but for, for purposes of what we've discussed today, we're really looking at these episodes of pancreatitis and what's being described are at least uh, a couple of episodes of acute uh, severe pancreatitis most likely uh, that have occurred with these recurrent episodes of pancreatitis. Uh, thanks, Dr. Tucker. Um, I think um, I talked about pancreatic divism and how um, pancreatic divism as a cause of acute pancreatitis remains controversial. Um, I'll ask, uh, uh, like to ask Dr. Kraft that uh, why do you think um, acute pan uh, pancreatitis, uh, the secondary to pancreatic divism, remains controversial? Sure. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So it's a great question. And uh, that's one that gastroenterologists today are, are grappling with. Um, and in fact, there is an ongoing randomized controlled trial, which is seeking to definitively answer this question. It's called the SHARP trial. Um, it's predicted to be completed in 2024. And that's part of the problem is we haven't had an actual randomized clinical trial to um, explore this topic. So most of the data is so-called retrospective, meaning um, looking at patient charts you know, after the fact. But just a little bit about uh, what is pancreas to be some, what's its relationship to pancreatitis. Um, to understand this concept, you, you got to know that one mechanism that pancreatitis occurs is because there's too much pressure in the pancreas duct. Typically, that's caused by a gallstone blocking off the pancreas duct so that this big sausage-shaped gland cannot drain the juices correctly. Well, in most people, the juices drain out through the dominant duct, the duct of Worsum. But in 10% of the population, that dominant pancreas duct is missing, and all of the juices have to drain through kind of a wimpy, much smaller duct um, in the top of the pancreas. So the theory is that there is um, a relative outflow obstruction of the pancreas juices and pancreas divisum. So um, therefore, the, the treatment for this provided by gastroenterologists is to do what's called a minor papillotomy, which is where we make a small incision on the minor sphincter. And um, it's a very difficult uh, type of ERCP procedure. Uh, it really should only be done by endoscopists with uh, a superior skill level, preferably at an expert center. Um, and it, as far as ERCPs goes, it's relatively high risk. So, um, and then the question is, well, if you get this relatively high-risk ERCP procedure to cut the minor papilla, which again is that sphincter muscle that drains uh, the duct of St. Irene, which is the smaller duct, but the only duct that's present in a person with divisum, well, then the question is, does that provide a therapeutic benefit? And really, it's not clear. And what's been found out is that a lot of people with pancreas divisum probably have underlying uh, genetic uh, risk factors for pancreatitis. Um, some studies have shown that people with pancreas to be some, uh, many of them who have recurrent pancreatitis also have at least one allele gene mutation for the cystic fibrosis gene. So um, 
bottom line is there, there is probably a small subset of patients with pancreas tibesum and recurrent acute pancreatitis that may be responders to ERCP with minor papillotomy. But I think a lot of patients who are found to have recurrent acute pancreatitis, the divisum is really an incidental finding. It's kind of a bystander, and it's not actually mechanistically the cause of their acute pancreatitis. Um, thanks, Dr. Kraft. Um, and the next question is, how difficult are the various interventions for acute pancreatitis if someone has a gastric bypass surgery? Um, I can take this question. So with the recent advances in endoscopy, endoscopic ultrasound, and some of the newer stent, and um, Dr. Tucker talked about uh, lumen opposing metal stent. So we are now able to go from the um, gastric pouch into a part of the stomach which has been bypassed. Um, so the, all these tools allow us to um, do these procedure. And one of the procedure we do is called an edge procedure. Um, this is an EUS directed transgastric ERCP. Similarly, we can do US direct, directed transgastric EUSs as well. And if there is a need for drainage, biopsy, EUS or ERCP, these procedures um, can be performed. Um, however, um, these procedure does have an increased risk as compared um, to regular procedures in patients uh, with a um, normal anatomy. So these uh, procedures should be done in a multidisciplinary setting um, and in experts' hands, uh, uh, they, they, they can have great outcomes. Um, next question um, to uh, Dr. Boone, uh, what subset, of, of what is the ideal timing for cholecystectomy for patients with um, acute gallstone pancreatitis? Sure, thanks, Dr. Singh. So, um, you know, I didn't really touch on cholecystectomy or removal of the gallbladder uh, during the talk because it's really more kind of geared towards the, the cause of pancreatitis and the etiology rather than a, a true complication. But as we kind of discussed, um, gallstones are a very common cause of acute pancreatitis. And in patients who come into the hospital with acute pancreatitis related to gallstones, generally, if possible, we like to try to take out the gallbladder as soon as possible and most commonly do it while they're in the hospital, that admission. Um, that's really the ideal time. And the reason is to prevent future attacks and prevent a setting where additional stones pass through and cause more damage to the pancreas. Uh, in certain cases where there is pancreatic necrosis or really severe pancreatitis with a lot of inflammation, it can actually be somewhat prohibitive because the surgery would be too difficult with the inflammation around the pancreas and gallbladder. And so sometimes we are not able to do that and it, and it does need to be delayed in order to, to remove the gallbladder safely. But when possible, we try to take it out during that hospitalization. Um. I don't think we have any more questions. So um, i like to thank all our speakers and the National Pancreas Foundation for the opportunity um, they provided us uh, to present this webinar. Thank you.